happy to be here, happy to have you here as well, participating in this hands-on workshop that we have on including security and compliance within pipelines. My name is Anthony Baer, as you see my picture up there and there. I am located in San Francisco. I'm a solutions architect with GitLab, uh, been so for almost two years. Two-year anniversary comes up at the end of this month. I know, it seems like it's been 14 years, seven years. <laughs> and then I'd like to introduce my esteemed colleague, James Sandlin over here, who is also going to be co-hosting the workshop we've got today. He is gonna be running block and tackle. If anyone has any difficulty or anything that's going on within their workshop environment, he's the man. He's always the man, but he's the man for this workshop as well. I'd also like to introduce Lisa Rom. She's here, she is our event coordinator for us being here and responsible for this workshop, if you will, for producing it, getting it all set up with the DevOps Days SLC. So thank you, Lisa, for that. There's another person that's not here that I don't see right now is Steve Clark, who's actually located here locally. Uh, is he in Ogden? I don't, I'm not sure, <laughs> he's close by, but he's a local, and if you have any questions or anything that he, that he can help you with as well from a sales perspective or whatnot, please feel free to ask him. So let's get on with the show a little bit. So before I get started, uh, I don't know if you guys were here when we were talking about the workshop and what it would be involved and so forth, but this is what I wanted to get to is from the people that are here from this workshop, what is your background in terms of application development? So by a show of hands, how many people here develop within their company? Okay, great. And then how many people are involved in security within their company? Great, that's awesome. I'm glad we have like a mixed audience. Any testers here, QA otherwise? Look at this, this is great. No wonder this is called DevOps, right? Because we're including the entire team, that's fantastic. How about operations or platform engineers? Great, this is awesome. I keep saying that, I'm sorry. Okay, and now how about product managers or those folks that are responsible for defining what changes are gonna be made to the project? Do we have any of those here today? No, which is a bummer, but that's okay because that's also part of the development process, right? We need to have solid defined requirements on what we're going to be developing, otherwise you get a lot of Easter eggs in your code, right? Thank you, James. So, <laughs> how about any release managers? Anyone doing that kind of responsibility to ensure that the right release is done? That's yeah, great. The gates, great. The gates are all adhered to. You don't have any problems that are going to be occurring. Fantastic. Is there anyone else here that, whose role I did not uh, ask about yet? Scrum masters, okay. So you, well, you could also be project managers or product managers as well, just kind of keeping the wheels rolling, make sure the scrums are coming through. Excellent, that leads into my other question too, is for most people that are here, what type of development process are you using? Are you doing waterfall, which is nothing to be ashamed of? Are you doing agile? Anyway, I'll stop with the polls. But um, a lot of development nowadays is done with code and ship, right? It's like we're just gonna be developing it and then once it's done, we're gonna crowdsource it in order to find out what all the bugs are within the application, right? So that's also a way that people are doing development nowadays, but I was gonna ask that is to find that out. Final and last question, and just by a show of hands, how many people are using six or more tools within their environment to do application development right now? And some examples there are, do you have one for doing CI, such as Jenkins? Are you, do you have one for doing CD, such as you know, maybe Argo CD, maybe you're using Spinnaker, maybe you're using some other technology. How about folks that are, you know, I mean, everyone's got an IDE probably, unless you're using VI or something like that, I don't know. And then you also probably have an SCM system, resource control system as well as part of your coding process. But by a show of hands, how many people are using six or more tools within their development process? All right, great, great, okay, fantastic. Good to know, so uh, hope to show you uh, being able to include security as well as compliance within your pipeline. So what we're going to do is we are going to take a part in developing a fictional application called Tanuki Racing that you see here. 
And it's a groundbreaking new application that's being developed and deployed in a beta trial stage right now. So what we need to do is help our developers make it more secure, kind of going back, and I recognize my microphone's not placed very well, going back to what I was asking before about what's missing in the DevOps, the security part, right? Is that security is usually a, a, a job that everybody needs to be focused on and needs to be a part of. However, how often are we including security as part of our application development process? We do, but it depends where, or you know, maybe we do it Maybe we don't, you know, that's a case-by-case -case basis, right? But here we're going to be looking at including security as well as compliance within our pipeline so that we can get more efficient results, shift that testing left, because the earlier you can find any kind of security vulnerability, the better off you are, right? Because it's easier to fix when it's earlier detected. You don't have it in production, so it can be exploited. So for all those reasons, it's better to find those vulnerabilities earlier in the life cycle as opposed to later. So that's a little bit of an agenda on what we're gonna to do today. You'll, t you'll see I'm speaking a little bit quickly because we only have two hours. <laughs> Believe me, it goes by fast. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up the lab for everyone to be able to work with. Then we're going to be doing what I was just talking about, shifting that security left, finding those vulnerabilities earlier within the pipeline as opposed to waiting till they're in production. Talk about including in compliance within the pipeline so that we can enforce specific jobs to be done each and every time a pipeline is run. And then we're going to be taking a look at the results of what we found from our security check. And then we're going to be looking at such things as who here has heard of an SBOM or know what that is? Okay, thank you very much. Do you wanna say or do you want me to say? That's a software bill of materials. Very good, exactly. And what? thing happened recently that makes this important? Well, it's always important, but the Biden administration now says that any federal agencies need to have an SBOM to be able to have that application working within a federal agency. So the SBOM has become extremely important for government agencies to be able to show an inventory list of all open source components that are included within their applications. However, as James had pointed out, it's not just that one thing. You're going to want to know which open source components are included within your application, and yes, you can find that in the manifest, but you don't necessarily have the vulnerabilities that are associated with those open source components, and we'll show that today. Next, we have uh, doing on-demand scans, so DASC testing to be able to set that up to dynamically, uh, dynamic application security testing. So you can dynamically test your application to be able to see if there's any kind of vulnerabilities in that case. And then also look at audit events, you know, what type of events have happened within your application or within your project to be aware of any types of vulnerabilities that also might be included with that or who's been poking around in my project. And then transferring the project, if you'd like, you can transfer the project that we're going to be working on today into your own environment. So that's why you also have that environment already set up. And then finally, a conclusion, we'll be able to review what we've already been talking about here. Any questions before I continue on? So far, so good, all right. I'm surprised James didn't have one, but it's okay. I don't mind. You're not allowed. No, just kidding. So all right, the first thing we're gonna do, yes, there's a question. Can you maximize that rough side? I can, so the reason why I have it set up here, well, you're also in the back row, sir. You can, there's plenty of room up here, but that's okay. So yeah, I can maximize it. As we're going through the lab though, you might wanna move forward because we're going to need to run two different browsers, as I was showing before, to be able to have the steps of the lab, as well as the actual work we're gonna be doing within the environment. But yes, thank you for, for pointing that out. I like this format too. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> thank you, James. It's <laughs> not true, he's much more than that. So anyway, uh, what we're going to do in getting set up is we're gonna log into the lab environment, which I think you guys already did, you people already did. We're very big at GitLab about being all inclusive people, as I apologize for my remark before. Anyway, log into the, the environment and then we're going to fork the workshop project and, um, and we're gonna work on that as we're doing our hands-on exercise. So this is the lab setup part. 
So for this, we, we're gonna do this in kind of laps. So they call this the warm-up lap, where it's really setting up the project to be able to be worked on. So we have a redemption code that I will show you in just a moment to be able to redeem, to be able to set up your lab environment. And there you go. Here it is. So this is the redemption code. And so um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to go back to my setup before to show you how this is, or maybe not. But I'm just gonna copy the same code and do it here. Let me go this. Because, yeah, I don't like the too small a screen, too. So let me go ahead and expand this over. And I'm going to create a new tab in here. So the URL you're going to want to go to is gitlabdemo.com. And then you should just that. What did I do? I'm not following instructions. gitlabdemo.com. Or I'm not spelling right. GitLabDemo.com. There we go. So if you go to GitLabDemo.com, you should see a screen that looks like this. And then remember the redemption code is here, 308CADC8. So once you have that, you go to redeem invitation code, and then we'll put in the code. 308CADC8. And then provision training environment. Three zero eight C A D C eight. And then you're gonna to want to find your GitLab user ID. So this is what we just did in terms of redeeming the invitation code. And then you'll want to find your GitLab ID. In this case, it's Mr. Logan Stucker, who helped us set up the lab itself. So if I, and for me, I know it's a bear 2 That's my GitLab handle. But you can find it here from that other session that you just logged into. If you go to your icon up in the right, your ID, and then drop down on it, you'll see your name as well as your user ID for GitLab located there. Let me know if you have any problems so far. So I put in my invitation code, put in my gitlab.com username, I'm gonna head, go ahead and provision the training environment. So you should be at a screen that looks like this. So far, so good? All right. All right, I'll take that as a thumbs up. Okay, great. All right, on with the workshop. Okay. All right, so once you do that, you go ahead and click on my group here that you have down here at the bottom, and then it should take you into something that looks like this, so that you have a test group and you have a new kind of test environment ID or name that's been put there for the group, so that you have a unique identifier for where that group exists. This is probably the hardest part of the workshop, <laughs> just to be able to get it set up. So never fear if you're, if you're not there. So far, so good? OK. Keep going. So you see, should see something like this. Uh, I guess I've got the same project I've got. Mm, I don't have that. So you should be able to. Once you get here, go ahead and click on New Project. Oh, did anyone get this error, just in case? No, so far so good, okay. All right, so we've got here. Uh, just a, a, re a notification or a reminder that we're gonna be using a web IDE here within GitLab that is um, VS Code based. So we will see that soon and shortly. You can opt out of it if you want. Uh, so if you want to do that, you want to opt out, just let us know and we'll help you set it up to be able to opt out. Okay, so now we're going to fork our workshop project. Everyone still with me? Still okay? Okay, okay, okay. I'll try not to be too worried about it. So we had this URL to be able to go to to get to the project, so I, I created a tiny URL to do that. So it's tinyurl.com slash devopsdayssLC. 
so it makes it easier to be able to work with. So I'm going to open a new tab. And I'm going to go to, I don't know if you guys can see that, it's kind of small, tinyurl.com slash devopsdaysslc. See it okay? And then that will display. So this is the workshop project we're going to be working with today. We're going to fork this project into our own environment. Everybody there? So far so good? DevOps Days SLC, tinyurl.com slash DevOps Days SLC. OK? And now we're going to fork the project. What I recommend, or what I was doing when I was going through this, is I was going. Can you show that role again, please? Uh, sure. Yeah, OK. So, OK. Yeah, we're just going to fork the project from this URL. All right, so just go to that URL app. Okay. Right. And then, so. so what we're doing is we're, we're basically forking an existing <laughs> project um, so that you have a code base to work with. Um, and rather than giving you the long URL for the project, we're doing that. Sorry for a couple of questions. So oh, no problem. Yeah. Any questions or anything, you know, feel free. Don't, don't be shy. This guy is happy to answer them. And me too. Because everyone, <laughs> probably other people have the same questions too. All right, so let's go ahead. On with the show. What I've done is I've gone back into the environment I was before. And the reason why is to be able to identify, OK, what is this new group I want to fork to? It's going to be L-U-E-R. looks good for me. So if I go in here into my workshop project, I'm going to go ahead and click on fork. And I'm going to call this workshop project duh, because I have already have another workshop project that's there. And then you'll see here, within the project URL, you're going to select the namespace you want to fork this project to. So as I was looking at before, it's in the L. Oh, I didn't spell it right, it seems like. See? Whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Oh, it's I-U-E, not L-U-E. OK. So this is a way that I learned to be able to find, like, to be able to get down to exactly what your uh, namespace is in your workshop project area. So this is the group that I've got. I'm going to go ahead and click on that. I'll give you guys a minute to be able to get there. I did a little magic there. I went over back where I was before, and then I saw my group name here with a unique identifier. So that was the unique identifier I searched on in order to fork it to the right place. That was a trick that I learned. So far, so good. And then once I do that, I can go ahead and fork the project. And now that workshop project will exist within my group that I've got here with the unique identifier. And it's called Workshop Project Do, as I had mentioned before. And this is the project that we're going to work with and we're going to do our exercise on. So what we need to do now is remove that fork relationship that we have for the original repository so that we don't mess up anything that's within that other project. So how I do that, I'm not following the slides very well, am I? Let me go ahead and do that just to make sure. OK. Best to open up side by side. OK, the fork the workshop project. Click fork. Is everyone there? OK, so far so good. Did the fork. All right. So now let's go ahead and remove the fork relationship so that anything that we do in this project will not be reflected on the original project. So in order to do that, we go into settings. And then we go into general. And then if you go all the way down within the general settings, you'll see that there's a space called advanced. I'll go ahead and expand on that. And then continue to flow down. And you'll see that there is a remove fork relationship that's there. And this will complete our setup pretty much, which is nice. I'll be glad to be through it so we can get to the good stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and remove the fork relationship. What you'll need to do is you'll need to type in the name of the project. Again, a little magic trick I do, not really so magic. I'm just going to copy it over into where it asks you to type it in. And then click Confirm. And now you'll see there's a new message at the top that says that the fork relationship has been removed. Now it's safe for me to be able to work on this project without affecting the original project.
So far, so good. I know, sorry about all that setup. Okay. Okay, so from now, what we're going to do is have the Learn Labs project that we have from the tinyurl.com slash DevOps Days SLC. There, we're going to have the instructions for the lab itself. If I look at a list of the different issues there, you will see that I've got eight different issues. Uh -huh. The latency. Hopefully, it goes away. There we go. It came up. So here are the different issues that we're going to be working on, and these will be actually the steps that we're going to have within our workshop. Okay. So, but before we do that, let's continue on. So now we're ready to start talking about shifting left within our development process and what that means and how we're going to do it. Is everybody okay so far with their project and the fork and having their own environment, removing the fork? Okay, keep going. All right, shifting left. So first we're gonna take advantage of how we can enable shifting left within our pipelines to look for any kind of security vulnerabilities we have within our project. And then uh, instead of having to wait till it's already in production, that would be bad news. So I kind of think about shifting left as being able to remediate any problems you have within your environment. So here we've got two different environments that have been set up in the wild, either having it just be thrown together as it is, or something that's well constructed, we want to make sure that we don't have any kind of vulnerabilities within our application when it gets out into the wild, right? We don't want anything to be exploited. We want to make sure we keep it secure. So the shifting left movement, everyone in this room is probably aware that being able to identify these vulnerabilities and remediate them earlier in the process is a lot less costly than having to remediate them when they're out in production. You don't have to go through the entire build cycle again, be able to deploy it back out once you've remediated it. If you can remediate it early in the life cycle, then you don't have to go through that rigmarole and the cost that's associated. So within the, so the DevOps life cycle, if you will, um, we incorporate in security as part of that, and that goes back to the question I had when introducing the workshop, is it's not only about developing the application and deploying it, we also need to make sure that security is part of that because there are so many different exploits that have taken place, right? You've got solar winds, you've got typo squatting, you've got uh, all sorts of different vulnerabilities that could be found within your application. So uh, this is a, a pipeline of what we're going to go through that goes from issues to merge requests, but I'll, I'll save that for later. So what we're gonna do is we are going to now work on doing our shifting left by incorporating in security within our application. So I go back into my environment here. And I am going to do like the split screen thing. I'm gonna pull a browser over here. And apologies for going back to being the small format, but I don't have a better way to do this given the current setup. I'm just glad it's all working so far. Everybody hasn't reported any latency or anything, so I'm happy about that. Okay, so I recommend that you do something like this, that you split your screen and have two different browser windows to be able to work from when doing the actual hands-on. So you can see the steps that are there on the left side, if you will, or if you're wanted on the right side, that's okay too. But this will give you the opportunity to be able to go from one side to the other, working, at, working on the steps as well as being able to incorporate them. So okay, so what we're going to do is that uh, we are gonna go to the main page of what we have within our project. All right, and then we're gonna add in security scans. As you see here, we have step one, add in the security scans. Make sure on the main page, okay. And then in the left nav bar, if you will, click on CICD and editor. So CICD looks like this. And then we'll click on editor. And you'll see that right now we have a gitlabci.yaml file in this. So our gitlabci.yaml files are YAML format to allow you to be able to express what you want to do within YAML as opposed to anything like Groovy or anything like that. So I've now gone in to be able to take a look at the CI CD 
pipeline that I currently have. So, but it doesn't really have anything with scanning that's there. So instead, let's go ahead and create a new branch to be able to incorporate the security scanning within. So go ahead and go up into my repository here that you'll see, and then select branches. Let me know if I'm going too fast, too slow, because I can't tell. <laughs> it's tinyurl.com slash DevOpsDaysSLC. Okay, so you'll see here, I've gone into the repository and I've gone into branches. And so I have this screen now, and I'm gonna go ahead and create a new branch, as it says in the instructions on the left. Okay, so here's my new branch, and I'm gonna call it completed pipeline as directed within the lab materials. So what this does is it creates a new branch that is off of my main branch that I have within my repository. So it'll create a branch with all the contents that I have within my main branch, and then I'll be able to modify those. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new branch called completed pipeline. Okay, so now I've got this new branch called completed pipeline that I'm within, and you'll see now I've got a new branch name here called completed pipeline. If I drop down on that just for fun, I have the main default branch that I've got, and now I've got my completed pipeline that I just created. Looks good, looks good. So let's go ahead and edit it. So go ahead and go back into my pipeline editor, as they have in the instructions. I'm gonna move over on my instructions here. And so now I've got a new content to be able to include as my new GitLab CI.yaml file. And you'll notice within this new content, I've got stages identified, I've got templates that are included. So I'll say a couple words about that. Is there a question? So, yeah, so there are multiple people who the tickets are not working or not copying when they pull up. Oh, no, they don't. They don't. That's why we need to do the side by side. That's why the side by side. We're oh, okay. Yeah, so sorry, James. <laughs> James brought up a great point, which is the reason why I have to do the side by side is when we fork that project, it's going to take everything from the repository and populate it within our new project, but it doesn't take the issues. So that's why we're doing the side by side in order to have reference for the issues. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> No, I wouldn't do that to you. So I'm going to copy over the contents and then I'll go over it a little bit within our new project that we've done. So the way that GitLab works is it actually spins up containers in order to do the jobs itself. So here we've identified an image for GitLab to be able to use to be able to do the jobs that we want associated with this pipeline. Within this pipeline, we've identified four different stages. So these are stages that you can associate your jobs with to be able to classify them in different parts. So if you want specific jobs for doing the build, you can associate that for doing test, for security. You have the ability to be able to define the stages and then define those jobs that will run within those stages. Here is a neat thing, something that's very helpful, is the fact that uh, GitLab has their own maintained templates that you can incorporate within your GitLab CI.yaml files in order to be able to include in our security testing. So we've got one in here for code quality. So this is how much quality you have within your coding. So say you have too many variables that aren't being used, you'll get a flag for that in terms of code quality. Also container scanning, so any kind of container images that you're using within your application, we can automatically provide you container scanning in order to look for any kind of vulnerabilities there. Same thing goes with SAS testing and dependency scanning. So any kind of open source components you're using that have vulnerabilities, dependency scanning will take a look at them and report them for you. Also secret detection and IAC. So if you have any issues within your Terraform or, what, or whatnot, you can also find them from there. Okay, so um, that's good for now. We're doing a Python project, so we're using pip install for it to be able to install it. Uh, gymnasium for that. Gymnasium is what we're gonna use for our dependency scanning. So okay, so once we've gone ahead and updated our gitlabci.yaml file, 
I can go ahead and look at the, the merged YAML. So what the merged YAML does is it brings in all the information from the templates into your merged YAML view. So all those templates I just showed you are now included in this master YAML file, as you, if you will, that includes all the different information. The nice thing about this is by using templates, you can abstract away a lot of these extra steps that you have. Not only that, but you can reuse those templates in other projects, right? They don't have to be necessarily tied to one project. They could be used universally throughout the organization. All right. OK, so now we can go ahead and commit our changes. So I'll go ahead and move down here. Oh, in edit, sorry. So you can put in a commit message in here directly if you'd like to be able to update your GitLab CI.yaml file. I'm gonna go ahead and go with my message and commit the changes. Notice what happens when I did that uh, commit is that automatically I get a pipeline that is kicked off based on the changes that I've made. And the reason for this is looking for any kind of those vulnerabilities earlier within the process as opposed to later so that you could take action on them, be able to remediate them. So I've gone ahead and kicked off a pipeline. All right. OK, let's go back and edit again. We can also take a look at the pipeline that's running, too. All right, let's take a look at the pipeline. So this was the actual resultant pipeline that I have kicked off as a result of that. So you'll recognize that I've got now my code quality included, I've got my container scanning included, I've got my dependency scanning included. All I needed to do was just include in those templates to be able to include in those extra security scans within my pipeline. Okay, so now let's go ahead and create a merge request based on the changes that we had just done. So if I go back up into my repository and then branches. Again, sorry, if I'm going a little fast, I know if you haven't done this before that it might be seeming like it's going by quickly. So anywho, okay, so here I've got my completed pipeline. I did that by going into my repository and then going into branches. Let's go ahead and create a merge request to be able to keep track on this branch for any kind of changes that I've made to it. Okay. So if you're at this point, go ahead and uncheck delete your source branch from the bottom so that when the merge is accepted, that branch will stay afterward. It doesn't get deleted. So you can go back to it and refer to it. Or you can create a new merge request out on that branch if you'd like. So it's kind of nice to have that, that branch around. So I've got a new merge request that's defined. It's called update gitlabci.yaml. OK, so far so good. I'm going to go ahead and create a merge request based on that. So now what we have is a place that has all the information that we've got within the pipeline in one place. So we've got our security scanning that's here, we've got our code quality that's here, we've got our SAS testing that's going to be here that will also show exactly what's happening. So my pipeline is still pending here. Let's see what's going on. That's what, oh, this is, might be the new one. Let's, let me check which other ones I've got. I've got one that's gone a little bit further on. Okay, this one's passed. Okay, that was just the build though when I did the initial. Here I've got in progress, it's kind of pending. Anyone else having, oh, is yours completed or it's pending or you're at this point? Mine looks like yours. Okay, okay. Anyone else at this point yet so far so good? All right, but are they pending or you guys got running? Pending. Pending, okay. Let me make a call to my friend Logan. Okay. <laughs> Wait, go ahead, James. <laughs> I won't pollute the screen any more than it already is. <laughs> but yeah, so we've set up an environment for folks that are to do the workshop. 
And so it looks like maybe we haven't allocated enough runners to be able to pick up the jobs that we we're all throwing at it at one time. So I wasn't sure exactly how many people. I guesstimated like 100. I don't, I don't, I don't know how many we've got. Calls for a selfie. Just so that you can get a little context of what's going on in the background. Um, the, every one of the little bubbles you see on the screen is considered a job in your lab, and every one of those bubbles is spinning up a Docker container in a Kubernetes cluster within which to do what you're doing. <laughs> and so, high probability, he set up a cluster with his X number of loads, right? And now either, either it crapped out Yay! Mine too. That helps because that helps me know if I need to tell you it's broken or if it just needs another node. So, yeah, when I created the merge request, I was surprised to see that I didn't have any security results yet. And the reason why is because I don't have any jobs that are run yet. So, as soon as these get run, then we'll be able to see what the security vulnerabilities are within my project. So, we'll keep going with that. And in the meantime, what I can do. is maybe show you something that is already complete. Yes, you may. So um, I, I use GitLab. I haven't seen the templates before. OK. Can you create templates to share projects that are in-house? Yes, absolutely. So you have projects that are already created by GitLab that you can consume, but you can also do your own unique pro uh, templates that you can consume. You can even create a project that holds those templates so that you have one unique place in order to grab them from. So yeah, there's, there's four different ways you could do it. There's local, so you could have a template locally within the same project. You've got remote that's there. You've got file. But yeah, follow up with us on that, and we can send you more information on that. But absolutely, that's the beauty of templates, is that you can use them throughout the organization. UH, OK. All right. So while we're waiting for that to complete, I did this lab already. So let me show you what it looks like within the merge request. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Question. Yeah, yeah.
My pipeline is nearly complete. Is anyone else's pipeline yet complete? It, all right. All right, we got one person so far that's complete. Mine is nearly complete as well. Has it started yet? Hopefully, not yet. All right, all right. We can keep going, though, and then we'll, we'll get back to it. But what I wanted to show you as a result of this is the fact that you've got the ability to be able to see and this is the shifting left concept, is being able to see the security vulnerabilities directly within the branch, right? We didn't have to wait to be able to pass this on to QA or to testing or security to be able to look at these vulnerabilities. We have those vulnerabilities that are included here. So if I drop down, I can see all the different vulnerabilities that are there. As you see, my container scanning found 25 potential vulnerabilities. Of course, this is a demonstration project, so we've already planted in those vulnerabilities in there. Hopefully, you don't have these types of vulnerabilities that are there, but you can deal with them within GitLab, which is nice, too. So not only do you have the ability to see those vulnerabilities, but if I click on one, I get a full write-up of, OK, everything that's about this vulnerability, the description of what it, what it is, what project it's located in, what kind of identifiers are associated. In this case, we've got a CVE that's there. Severity is critical. It's showing you know, where it was found, uh, reference links that you can take a look at, and then, okay, what's the solution, right? Great, let's upgrade our image to be, or to be able to use the AP key tools of 2.10.7-R0. You have the ability within GitLab to be able to dismiss vulnerabilities as well if you have a chance to take a look at them and say, we don't want to deal with this, so this is bad practice, but I'm gonna go ahead and dismiss this vulnerability so that it doesn't show up. And there, it goes in, into a deeper conversation in terms of how these are found, how they're reported, and how you deal with them, how do you triage them. But we are working through including in security as well as compliance in this workshop. But if you have any questions on that, or we can also have a further discussion, we'd be happy to do so. So as you see, I've now taken a look at this one critical CVE and I've dismissed it. It shows as being dismissed within my merge request. Again, so it gives me visibility within one place to be able to see the results of my pipeline. Here I can also see what kind of licenses I'm using within my project. In my case, I've gone ahead and put in a license policy for MIT license that uh, leads it as being uh, denied. So anyway, I gotta get back to the regular lab itself. <laughs> that was within the one that I've already completed. I just wanted to show you some of the features that were there. So once your pipeline is completed, it should look like this. If you have any exclamation points or any X's showing, we can help you with that. The exclamation points would indicate that your pipeline passed, but that job failed, but it was allowed to fail. See, that's another thing that we have that is flexible within our YAML files. You can set up rules to say, okay, if this job fails, don't fail the entire pipeline. And we use that with an allow failure for those that are already using GitLab and whatnot. Again, Anything you guys want to go deeper into, we're happy to, to discuss with you. So feel free to, to hit us up afterward or whatnot. Okay, so uh, let's see. If I go back into my MR, which is the update GitLab CI to YAML file, now you see I've got those security measurements that are being included now that have whatever potential vulnerabilities I have. This is in a different project than the one I was just showing, as you know. So I've got the license compliance that's there, security scanning. All right. Okay, let's go on to exercise two, or on with the slideshow. Okay, exercise one is completed. 
Okay, now let's talk about compliance frameworks. I started to allude to this when I was doing a pitch for this workshop about SOX compliance, PCI compliance, HIPAA compliance, right? So there are certain things that you may want to include within your pipelines or ensure are run within your pipelines so that you have this compliance and you're adhering to the standards that are put forth within the compliance. We can do this within GitLab by assigning a compliance framework to the project that will automatically run specified jobs based on what you want to comply with. Okay, now that we started to define a new pipeline for security tests, we want to include, we want to allow, or we want to ensure that the developers are abiding by security best practices. So we're gonna create a compliance framework or we're gonna assign a compliance framework so that we ensure the right jobs are uh, ran in the correct order and the devs uh, can't uh, skip a few steps just for that. And so I was just mentioning, here's just some examples of compliance frameworks. SOC 2, SOX compliance, ISO, GDPR, et cetera. That, uh, these are examples of what you can set up as compliance frameworks to assign to projects to ensure that the projects that you're working with are compliant. Okay, so the benefits are to ensure that the dev teams are following best security practices. The features can be applied to many different projects. So it's, you don't assign the compliance just on a project by project basis, and I'll show you, or we'll do that within the lab, is to apply a compliance framework to the project that ensures that those Compliance pipelines are associated with that project, so they get included within the pipeline every time that they're run. So now we're going to go to our compliance framework exercise, which is in issue two within the project. So I'm gonna go back into the project we forked from, and then go ahead and click on compliance framework, and then we get instructions for our next lab. So okay, so um, first we're going to take a look at the compliance framework that we're gonna be applying to our code base. So over here you have the instructions, here you have a hyperlink to be able to get to where you want to get to. I'm gonna go ahead and highlight my other window so it goes there. Click here. Oh, okay, well it shows here. <laughs> so here's the compliance framework that I have for this. This is actually a project where the compliance framework pipeline is associated, and this is the pipeline that we have for that. You don't have to do this. This is just to kind of give you an idea about what's included within a compliance framework pipeline or compliance pipeline. Here we have stages that have been identified for the pipeline. Here we have a, the specific jobs that are included as part of the pipeline. All right. So we'll take a look at the stages. Yeah, we just did that. Notice that the pre-stage, so there is a pre-stage in there that we'll see within our project once we apply the compliance framework that will give you a message. In this case, I think it just is a, a print of hello from the compliance team. And then within the compliance job that I showed you, uh, it will be included as part of our project. So now we're going to apply the framework itself. Go back to our project here which in my case is workshop project de. And then how you do that is we go into our settings, as you see here, settings general. And if I scroll down, I'll see compliance framework. And I'll go ahead and expand that. And I can choose which frame, easy for me to say, choose which framework I want to associate with this project. In this case, I'm going to want to choose the security and compliance workshop framework to apply. So the compliance pipeline that's included within that project will be included as part of my pipeline and you'll see that as soon as we kick off the, kick off the, pro, uh, the pipeline again. So okay, once I've applied, I've said security and compliance workshop, I'm gonna go ahead and save changes. All right. Okay, so now if I go back into my project here, it's nice to have these breadcrumbs. Do you want me to bump the font on this by chance, or is this okay? I haven't heard anyone say it's too small or anything, so it's okay? Okay, all right, great. So now you'll see in your project as well as mine, you should see a label here indicating that we're using the security and compliance workshop framework within this project. Does everyone see that so far? For those that were able to migrate all of the different 
<laughs> parts of the lab and everything. All right, great, excellent. So now let's go ahead and move on. Timing-wise, we're doing great. So far, so good. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us. All right, so you got that. Compliance framework now, parsing the results. So now we're going to take a look at the results that we had from that. So we are going to take a look at the merge request that we had just created, just as I already showed you a little bit earlier, but now we'll take a deeper look into what we had seen. So the different types, you probably already saw this within the pipeline, but these are all the different security jobs that we included within our pipeline just by including in those templates. We have SAS testing that's been included. We have dynamic application security testing that was included, container scanning, dependency scanning, et cetera, just by including in the templates. These, and for the template questions too, those templates can also be overridden so that it, you don't have to comply or you don't have to use that template as is. You can also override jobs within those templates to be able to have a different behavior depending on what you need from those templates or create your own. Roll your own templates and be able to store them someplace for everyone to be able to take advantage of. This kind of gives you a, an idea about where the different scanners would normally live within the pipeline itself. So normally it would have such things as SAS and secret detection within the commit phase or within your merge request itself where you're doing your coding. You would do your container scanning as after you build the image, right? As was discussed before about building a Docker image, then you're gonna to wanna to scan the container of the, the, of the container that you created. And then we also have API security and then DAS testing, and those occur a little bit later within the, the cycle to be able to have something staged to be able to test against, right? If we don't have some, an application staged to be able to test against, then it's difficult to do dynamic application security testing, but we'll see that a little bit later. And then we've also got operational container scanning that we have as a means of being able to ensure no new vulnerabilities have been reported for those applications you've already deployed, okay? So far, so good. We also have policies that are available. So we can define a scan execution policy or a scan result policy. And what this does is it creates a policy to be run on the event of having a scan result. So the scan result means that we have found five different container scanning vulnerabilities that are critical high severity. So we want to create a merge request approval for that. We want to have somebody say, OK, do, are we going to allow these vulnerabilities within our application, or are we going to remediate them beforehand? We can control that by creating a merge request approval that will have you wait, take a look at what those vulnerabilities are before actually incorporating them into the application. We also have the scan execution policy that's available that will be able to take a look at a specific schedule within the project pipeline so that we can run each time with that execution and be able to create rules based on that. So we'll be able to take a look and work with that currently within parsing the results. So now we can go back into our project and go into our next exercise. Everyone feeling okay? Any breaks needed or anything so far? Question? MR approval page or just the, sorry? If they're in the same branch, they won't, if it's in the same branch. But if he creates a new branch, then a new scan will take on for that new branch, and then they'll, they'll show up there. However, however, you do bring up a good point, which is the fact that, and we'll see this a little bit later on, we have such thing as having a security dashboard as well as a vulnerability report that's generated. And this is specifically for the main branch or the default branch, so that Things can happen within the feature branches, but the reports that you get here within your security dashboard or vulnerability report, these pertain to the default branch. 
So that you can do your remediation within the feature branch even before they get into the default branch. That's the idea. So it gives you the ability to be able to triage those earlier in the life cycle as opposed to having to triage them after. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks for bringing that point. That, we can dismiss vulnerabilities. We can also make comments on them for that and then set exactly, okay, when do we want to surface those again so we make sure that they're remediated at, at some given point of time, but you can do that. If, if, if that makes sense, a, a lot of times some of the vulnerabilities that you'll find that you need to make a decision as to how secure you need it to be secured. In my experience in working with organizations, most people will it, so first caveat is that trying to secure and trying to remediate all vulnerabilities is difficult to do at best, right? Because look at all, I mean, these, this is a sample projects. We've got a lot of vulnerabilities, but still uh, trying to remediate all of them. So usually the security organization will come up with a policy that says we don't want any critical vulnerabilities. Sorry, I didn't realize that's going to happen. A critical high severity or medium severity vulnerabilities period, right? So the, the team needs to keep that in mind and then you'd set your policy based on those. And a merge request approval is one way of doing it to be able to make sure that there's additional eyes on it, but then also uh, being able to dismiss the vulnerabilities and have them show up later to be able to do that. The other thing is, is that you can have known vulnerabilities. In fact, there probably are known vulnerabilities within the application you're currently shipping so, but the idea is to make sure that those don't stay vulnerable long, and especially if they're critical or high, right? Because the other thing that can happen, and probably everybody's aware of this too, is that you're using open source components, and maybe there isn't a vulnerability that had been discovered against it yet, right? And so that's why you need to have this monitoring process later, or being able to look at that default branch continually, because new vulnerabilities are being discovered on a daily basis, and you need to take those into account. So. You need to continually test and continually look for those vulnerabilities, not just within the feature branches, but also the main branch too, or the default branch.
Does it help? All right. And yeah, we're, we're happy to discuss this as well after and so forth. So we're ready now for our third exercise, which is parsing the results. So we've already done a little bit of a spoiler alert on that, but let's go ahead and go back into our merge request that we created. So here's where our merge requests are. Apologies for the small screen for that, but this was the merge request that we had created earlier. And then, yeah, as I said, a little bit of a spoiler alert is that once we open that up, we can see that we've got our code quality there. Merge request approval for this right now, it's optional because I haven't created a policy to invoke a merge request approval, nor have I identified a merge request approval that needs to take place on this. So we don't have one that is required yet. However, I also have my security here, and you'll, say, you'll see it's ready to merge because I haven't requested any kind of merge request approval yet. Okay, so we'll see the, the approval section. You can see our code quality license compliance that we just took a look at. Go ahead and take some time to expand each report, which we kind of did a little bit earlier. Go ahead and look at my security scanning. And then I had already dismissed one vulnerability. Here's all my SAST vulnerabilities. Here's all my container. I don't have any dependency vulnerabilities yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and, here's a critical one I have within SAS. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So here's the project that it's located within. This is the file where it is, and then the identifier for that. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and dismiss the vulnerability as it asks for in the instructions, even though I'd done that before. And you do that by clicking on this dialog box that you see here that says add, commit, and dismiss. So I'll do so and say, we are going to dismiss this. And then go ahead and add comments and dismiss. So now you see, again, I've got that dismissed label that's showing within my application, within my uh, merge request, if you will. Okay, so now let's go ahead and merge. Let's merge our changes that we had made. So I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down. No approval necessary yet. So let's go ahead and click on the merge. So, all right. It's gonna merge, and once that happens, again, you'll get a new pipeline that is kicked off. So we will see that showing up on here too. Okay, so we've done that. So if I go into CICD again in my pipelines, here I have a new pipeline that's running for my merge request that I just merged in. Does anyone notice anything different on this pipeline? Maybe it's not very, very obvious. It, it is to me, is that, guess what? Now we've got a compliance job that's been included. This wasn't in our original GitLab CI.yaml file. This comes in as part of our compliance framework that includes in another job within our pipeline automatically. We didn't have to put this in our GitLab CI.yaml file. It's already included. We also get uh, the testing that is also included within that, like the unit test that I have that also came from the compliance pipeline that I've got. Okay, all right. So, knowledge of main pipeline is completed. The reports under security and compliance have been generated. So, these guys will take a while to show. In fact, the security dashboard gets populated at the end of day to be able to incorporate any changes within the project, but I will go ahead and show you, and this is why I did this one earlier too, to be able to see the results rather than having to wait for them. So here we have our security dashboard for our application that shows that we have a number of critical vulnerabilities that are there that have not been remediated. We also have high vulnerabilities that are there that have not been remediated as well as some informationals that look like it's here. But anyway, you've got the statistics here. The other thing is the vulnerability report that I've got that allows you to be able to take a look at the vulnerabilities that are associated with the default branch. This isn't within the feature branch. This is, these are things within the default branch so that we know that these are included within the application itself. It's not part of the feature branch. They don't get double reported in essence. It, that was also one of the questions that came up too. So we've got, and you can slice and dice these as you like. So again, I was talking about you know, triaging versus confirming the vulnerabilities, dismissing them, or being able to resolve them. So here we've got the ability to be able to filter on the status, on the severity. My pipeline hasn't run completely yet, but I'm interested to see if I've got any dismissed yet. 
Oh, yep, it does look like I do have. Oh yeah, that's right, I had done this a couple days back. I'm sorry, so. <laughs> I had done this lab a couple days back to run through it to see if we'd have any problems or anything, and I did identify one of the vulnerabilities as being dismissed, so here, Going back to the question about dismissing vulnerabilities and then re-raising them again, you can actually filter out on the dismissed vulnerabilities to be able to see that. All right. Okay, so we are gonna go ahead and let that pipeline cook. It's one of my son's favorite sayings now. I don't know where he got that. Let them cook or let him cook. I don't know. I don't understand today's youth. It's not, it's, you know. Anyway, getting, uh, getting all things aside, let's go ahead and do create some security policies as well. Is everyone still with me or trying a little or I get it, trying to keep up it? All right, people are there. Others, hopefully you're still there. Okay, because I want to make sure I get you guys out of here on time. <laughs> so I want to make sure that we get through what we need to get through. So let's go ahead and create a preventative security policy. Step number three in parsing the results Issue number three. So I'm gonna go ahead into my security and compliance. Mm, wasn't supposed to go like that. I'm gonna go down into policies. So security and compliance and then policies. And then you should get a screen like this. Oh, sorry, this is not the right project. That's the one I've already completed. <laughs> so here we go. Let me do it in this project that I haven't done yet. I'll go here. Go into my security and compliance, go into policies. Okay, here are my policies. I don't have any identified yet. However, never fear, let's go ahead and create a new policy. So we're gonna click on new policy over here on the right. All right, and then we are going to have, create a scan result policy. Remember I was talking about scan result policies versus execution policies. Let's do the scan result policy. Go ahead and select that one. And then let's give it a name. Let's call it scan result policy. That's very creative, right? Not very creative. Okay, scan result policy. So far so good, hopefully. All right, all right. So under rules, I'm gonna want to, you'll notice something new, James, is now we have, we can either create a scan result policy type based on a security scan or a license scan. So if we find, so in this case, we're gonna take a look at the vulnerabilities we have. If we have any critical, high, or whatever we want to select, we're going to create a merge request approval for that. We can also do the same for licenses. So if we find a license that is out of compliance, like you saw in my completed project, MIT license, I said, okay, flag that and say, let's create a merge request approval for that so that we don't allow that license in. Now, an MIT license is an open source license, it's perfectly safe, but there are other licenses you want to exclude from your project and not have any application for those licenses or what they say. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the security scan instead. And right now it says all scanners, so I can filter this by whatever scanner I want. I can look at all of the scanners or limit it down. I'm gonna go ahead and deselect all of them, clear all, and I'm gonna go ahead and select secret detection. As you saw, I did a little trick there. I had to scroll up a little bit in order to get to the secret detection. And right now I'm on bullet point number two in step three. So I do, okay, here's my secret detection that I've got. Okay. And now for vulnerability severity levels, let's go ahead and select what we have there. We're gonna select all for this so that if we have any of these, which is I think a little over the top. Uh, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't do it for critical high and medium myself personally, but it's asking us to do that. So and it's also, you could also limit it to how many of them. Like maybe one is acceptable. I don't know, maybe three are acceptable. You can also create multiple policies as well. So you can decide like what you want to do on that. In this case, we're going to leave it at zero for that. You also have the ability to be able to identify uh, vulnerability states. We're gonna say newly detected, it says, okay. And then we can decide like which branches that we want to, want to do. So in this case, all branches. So this includes my feature branches as well as my default branch that you see here. Or we can select it for main. 
So we're going to go ahead and switch it to being on our main branch instead of all branches. OK. All right. So here is where we can define who the merge request approvals will be. So this can be either individuals, individuals, that's easy for me to say. And I'm going to define myself here as one, a bear two, you might have recognized from before. It's myself. Then I'm going to ask uh, a bear two, wait, no results found. I just saw myself. Did I, I shouldn't be including, oh, there we go. Whoop. I keep going away. <laughs> I think that's what it is. I think that's what it is. There it is. OK. There we go. James uh, Sandlin. <laughs> no? Oh. What? All right. Well, it'll just have to be me then. It's all on me. OK, one approver. So you could also, as you see, we can select for groups. So we could have a group of approvers. And then how many of those approvers we need to have. In this case, I've got one. But if I, had, if I wanted to have two approvers, right? So launching any kind of nuclear weapon, you want to have two people so that one person doesn't go crazy and just do it themselves. Anyway, so that's what you can do. And then we can configure this with a merge request. So what this will do is incorporate this YAML file within our security policies project. So if you're good at YAML, you can read through this and see what's going on. Here's our name, security result policy, description, I didn't put anything in. It is enabled. Here are the rules that we've got there. So for our main branch, we're going to look at our secret detection scanner. And I'm not going to allow any vulnerabilities within that. And I'm looking at all different critical severity levels that I've got. And then what's the vulnerability state? In this case, it's just newly detected. And then what's the action that's going to take place? We're going to say require approval. Uh, approvals required, did I put in two? I did, look at that, see, it's smarter than I am. I'm gonna say one, and then see, now I get an updated approval required there. I'm glad I went through that, okay. And then configure with a merge request. So this will create a merge request to be able to include this code within my security policy project. All right, configure with a merge request. A resulting merge request, click merge. Let's see here, should probably bold that. And so now that policy has been merged, and then we'll be able to see it. Before we move on, let's go back to our project. Use the breadcrumbs at the top of the screen, click back into your group, and then click back in the project. However, before I do that, notice that I, knew have, I have a new project that's been created called Security Pro uh, Policy Project. And that's where this policy will reside. So we have one place where those policies will live so we can go back and modify them as needed. All right, let's go back into our workshop project. So here's our new security policy project, check it out. So if I click into that, I know, I'm just, a, I'm just crazy for punishment here. But here's the policy that we just created with that YAML file, right? So we, can, we don't have to use the UI to be able to create the YAML file, we can work directly with it here. So if I don't wanna have all these different uh, vulnerability severity levels there, I can do that. I don't know if I want to go off the beaten path. Maybe I won't. Because <laughs> number one, we don't have a lot of time. Number two, it's I'm having fun. Maybe that's worth it. OK, so we go, let's go back into our regular project. So here's our group. This is the project I've been working with. You'll see Security and Compliance Workshop. Compliance Framework assigned. All right, now that we have a protective policy in place, let's go ahead and ensure that it works by removing the secrets currently within the code base. Let's go into our uh, web IDE within our project. Ooh, ooh, it's getting interesting now. OK, is everybody here? Is everybody OK with watching me do it too? Or <laughs> Some people are there. Some people are watching. OK, it's OK. So I'm going to go ahead and go into our web IDE that's here. And here's my new web IDE. All right, so as you see, this is the workshop project that I had. You are probably familiar with this VS Code interface to be able to know that, all right, this is my workshop project and all the contents of it. I'm going to go ahead and edit my run.py, py, Python file. How do people, how do you, or how do, what do you call it? Do you call it pi or do you call it p? 
P-Y or? <laughs> I like to call it pi, so that's, that's why I say it. But anyway, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and include in a secret within my run pi file. Run.py, run pi. Just like that. Uh, is this font big enough to be able to see? Seems like it. So I copied the contents that I had within my lab steps into my file. So far, so good? Give it a second. Okay, I'll go ahead and commit and push. And then commit to a new branch I think it wants me to do here, I'm pretty sure. All right. So we can call, what do we want to call this? Let's call it mm, secret branch. I don't know, maybe that's a bad name. Bad name. Ugh, can't spell. And then enter. Okay, so now we have created a new branch. And then create, thank you. <laughs> and then create an MR for it. And so now we have a new MR that we're going to associate with this. And you'll see I have my new branch in there already associated. And I'm going to do update file run pi with a secret. All right, and then let's keep that source branch around again. And then we'll go ahead and create the merge request. All right. Okay, so on the resultant MR, wait for it to complete, and then notice that our policy is not requiring a review. If time permits, we can go ahead and merge our new fix. Okay. All right, so let's move along. Okay, so next is taking a look at license compliance and the software bill and materials, as we had talked about earlier is here, so that we receive so many different vulnerabilities, we want to keep track of all these different open source components, so we're going to take a look at uh, utilizing the software bill of materials that is included as part of the dependency scanning. So that, uh, yeah, SolarWinds, people probably remember, Log4j, another vulnerability that was exploited as part of open source components. So it's important. So we're going to take a look at our SBOM report to be able to see the software dependency list. But more than that, we're going to also look at the vulnerabilities that are associated with those open source components so we get a feel for how vulnerable our application is by using those. We are going to produce a Cyclone DX format for our software bill of materials. People may re recognize that format. There's also SPDX. That's another SBOM format. But the Cyclone DX was approved by OWASP as a format to be able to report these dependencies. All right, so let's take a look at our software bill of materials within our lab. We still have 41 minutes, 41 minutes according to the timer. Does anyone need a break? Or are you just at Zen? Is it Zen? <laughs> okay, so software bill of materials reports and license compliance, it's a lot of material to go through, so I'm glad we had two hours to do it. All right, we'll take a look at the SBOM reports and the scanners that created to see the various licenses as well. So let us go in and review our um, software bill of materials report. So we go into our project again. And then we go into our security and then we'll see our dependency list here. So these are all the different open source components that are being used within my project. Not only that, but I also have 15 vulnerabilities with this expat component, and that's not very good. But these are all the different vulnerabilities that we can take a look at. So by utilizing the software bill of materials, we get visibility into all the different vulnerabilities that are within our project. All right. So click through a few of the components and the details that are provided with each vulnerability. So it's the same that we had had before, that if we look at a, a specific vulnerability that's within our software bill of materials, we could see 
the namespace that was located, all the different resource links you have for it, what the identifier was for it. We have the ability to also create a new issue for it to be able to remediate that vulnerability within our development process. Okay, so that's nice. We can also export this if we wanted to, our software bill of materials that is, into a CSV file or whatnot to be able to work with it in that if we wanted to, or be able to, or sorry, it's a JSON format, or we can just work with it within our environment too. Yeah, we have, we have an extensive API, yeah. It is, so you can actually get it from the API. So if I, I take a look at it, the file that's exported, uh, JSON format, where's my prettier? Ah, oh, it's not installed on here, I should. Anyway, yeah, you're probably right. Uh, I won't try it now though, because I'm gonna wreck it. This is not the good, the best time to do it. All right, so, and then license compliance. So we have our export, we had our JSON file that was from that. Let's go ahead and take a look at our license compliance. So a little bit of a spoiler alert. I took a look at that a little bit earlier, but go into license compliance. These are all the different licenses that were discovered as a result of running our Pipeline, so I can also go in and put in a, this is what I did before to be able to put in a license policy within my completed project, is let's take a look at our MIT licenses and add a license policy for those. So go ahead and click that in, say MIT license. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Leave that to the lawyers, as we say. So, all right, so I have a new, I, I created a policy for my MIT license, and I wanted to say, okay, it's been denied, so that if it's detected within the project, then I'm going to have a policy violation that shows up as part of that. As you saw earlier with doing the scan result policy, I could also do this and create a merge request approval for having a license that we don't want to include within our project or within our application itself. All right. Moving right along, on-demand de on scans, audit events. Let's talk about that. Okay, so here we are. So now we, we have secured our application through the use of our compliance frameworks, policies, and scans. It's now time to double check, especially in the worst case scenarios. In this section, we're gonna cover uh, dynamic application security testing to be able to apply that. So in, in terms of the state of the software supply chain, I've been talking about this in terms of uh, who here has heard about defendant, dependency confusion or knows what that is? That is the case where you have something, like, okay, you have, okay, then you have something, people are afraid to raise their hands now because I'm gonna call on them and ask them to explain it, so I, I, I won't this time. But you say you have something like the Django that you're including within a Python project, but somebody creates another open source component and calls it Django, right, with two A's instead of one A. I mean, even Django is a, a vulnerable component. But people do that and they call it um, dependency confusion so that you have maybe a different spelling so that if a developer accidentally makes a mistake in terms of defining which components they want to include and they accidentally include a vulnerable comp component, then that makes the project exploitable and whatever they have in that open source component, they can take advantage of their application or their resources they have, get into a backend database and be able to exploit that out, be able to pull that out, et cetera. So dependency confusion typo squatting or malicious code injection. So maybe somebody is maintaining a component. There was also a story I heard about somebody taking over an open source component. Someone had, you guys had heard about that too. Are you guys from security by chance? <laughs> yeah, right, so what happens is that developers will leave their open source components, they're maintaining them for years, and then somebody got a hold of the repository that had this open source component in that, 
took it on as their own, injected in some malicious code, and then saved the component, getting ready for people to be able to use that open source component within their application. And then they would exploit out that application, take a look at their database, get control of their entire environment, just from using that one open source, com uh, open source component. So you want to be careful not to be including in vulnerable components. We also have included some training that's available, security training that's in, that is available as well. So all right, let's go ahead and take a look at incorporating in on-demand scans. All right, so what we're gonna do is let's go back to my project here. Let's go into left bar, go into security, and then we're gonna do on-demand scans. All right, a new scan. So we are going to define a dynamic application security test. So new on-demand scan, my DAST. All right. I'm going to select the scanner profile. We're going to call a new scanner. And then we're going to call this my new scanner. I know, I'm sorry. I'm not very creative today. Must be tired. And save the profile. We can leave the defaults as they are. <laughs> and then let's go ahead and put in a site. So what this does is it has a target URL for our DAST scanning to work against, right? Because we need that. We need something for it to hit. And in this case, we're just going to put in a dummy URL called www.example.com slash home. Is it copy that over? As what we'd have for that. So do a site profile, create a new one for that. Say this is my default app or whatnot. I don't know. I'm sorry. Not very good at that. And then put in my target URL. So this could also be within your application development that you have a review stage that you're going to run the DAS test against. So that, again, before it gets into production or turn the default branch, you can identify any kind of DAS vulnerabilities that you have and remediate them beforehand. So this will actually take a look at that URL. And once it goes into that URL, it will look for any additional accessible URLs that are there and then also try to get on those two to be able to exploit them. So I'm going to go ahead and save that profile as well. All right, so we, I clicked Save Profile and then Save Scan. So we have that available. OK, so now we've created a new on-demand scan. This target is not valid. So if I run this scan, it's not going to show up. There's also this passive and active mode, where the passive mode tests that URL and looks for any additional URLs that are there and reports back on them. The active mode will actually keep going on those additional URLs to look for any kind of vulnerabilities that it has within there, within the extra URLs, if you will. So one thing that we talked about a little bit is audit events. Remember, I was talking about, OK, what, who's been doing what with our project? So if we go into security and compliance again, we can take a look at our project audit events. And this gives you all the different activities that I've been doing so far within my project. And you'll see these as well, which is kind of nice. They say, all right, what has been happening? All right, someone's added some DAS scanner. Someone's added a site profile. That'd be me. Right? And then the security policy project, as you can see, all those things that I had been doing within the project so far are now listed within my audit events. So you have a clear traceability, auditability project that the auditors will be happy to know, right? They're always the ones that are, OK, what's been happening with this project? Please let us know. Here you have that information at your fingertips, which is nice. OK, all right. So we also have the ability to be able to scan or be able to create a security configuration here. So this is where we can configure our security test. So maybe for our SAS testing, these are the so this is the image profile that we're using for it. This is the if we wanted to do some excluded paths from the SAS testing, which are no are developer paths or ones that we don't necessarily need to look for any kind of statistic, uh, static application security. We could do that and also which stage you want to apply it to. In this case, we're calling it test, and then we're also doing a max step four, but it has it gives you the ability to be able to look at that for your SAS testing. OK, so yeah, take note of all the various settings we can utilize. And most of these settings can also be changed by using variables in your pipelines. 
And then still within the security, let's take a look at the vulnerability management security configuration. And then we go into vulnerability management if we go down here. Oops, I passed it. Oh, sorry, here. So here's where we can include in any kind of security training within our, our environment as well if we'd like to. Okay, getting near to the end, getting there-ish. So far so good. I guess that is pretty much the end at this point. Here's where you have the ability, if you want, with the project you have already, that you can transfer it into your own environment so that you can move it into your own namespace to have fun with it yourself. I'll see if I can get you these steps if you'd like to be able to do this on your own as well, at your own unhurried pace, instead of having to have me go through it so quickly. Uh, and then some of the, if you don't have a GitLab Ultimate, so the people that signed up for a, an account today, I believe it comes with an Ultimate license automatically for 30 days. So you can take advantage of all the features that you have within this project currently that I've shown you. But if you don't have an Ultimate license, the premium will be a little bit less of the security that I've already been showing you. Okay, so next is to transfer the project. And then we can go back into our lab steps to do that. But you probably have an idea about how you would do that. You'd be able to export the project itself to be able to import it into your own environment if you'd like. So this is how you would do it to be able to export it. So it's completely optional, but if you want to transfer it, you can go ahead and transfer, transfer the project. So if I go, okay, projects cannot be transferred when there are images in the container registry. You clean them up by packages. And, all right, let's take a look. So we also have packages and container registries that are here. See if I've got anything within my container registry. I do. So I'm going to have to break these out. So I'm going to go ahead and remove my containers. These were pushed as a result of doing my build. So this also, you also have the ability to use your own containers for doing your jobs within GitLab. As you saw within my GitLab CI.yaml file, I have the ability to define the image I want to use. So in this case, I'm using a Docker image, and it's, it's the latest. But I could have defined this as my own image to be able to use to do the work that I wanted to do. It's very flexible in terms of that. The other thing that's nice about GitLab is you can also incorporate in additional scanners if you'd like. It's a platform that you can work with to be able to integrate in different things that you may already be using within your development organization so that you can still continue on that path and then also have additional capability that's there. Okay, so I've gone ahead and deleted out my container images. Let's go back into my settings. And then general, just here. So let's go into advanced. This is for transferring a project. It's completely, completely optional. And so here you have the ability to export the project. Or sorry, transfer instead, let's do that. So here we have that namespace. Again, all right, so I had the one, isn't I, U, E, I think it's already there. Anyway, no, I don't think that's, what was it again? Or do I want to put it in the other one? Let's put it in here instead, L, U, H. Same trick I did before by being able to take a look at that unique identifier for my environment. Oh, it's not showing up, okay. <laughs> I'll do it into my own. Okay, I'll put in dev projects for myself, but then I could go ahead and transfer this. All right, let's see. Spend advanced, go to transfer project, select a new namespace, if they're, search for your name and then select it, your name will, will most likely be under users. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it the way it says it then. Here's my name. Okay, this will be your actual name and not your GitLab ID. Confirmation message will then pop up where you need to re-enter the name. So transfer project, all right. Re-enter the name. I'm going to go ahead and copy it over again and paste it in and confirm. All right, your project will then be immediately moved to your personal namespace for you to reference in the future. All right. 
So there we go. That's me. <laughs> My workshop project. OK. It's all right. So I think that's pretty much everything that we we're going to show, and we got through in good time. So in conclusion, we were able to go through and set up the lab. We did a lot today, right? Or, and then, so we looked at shifting left, being able to look at that security earlier on within the life cycle to be able to remediate those vulnerabilities early on where it doesn't cost as much as it would if they were in production. Being able to dismiss vulnerabilities, we did that. Being able to look at compliance frameworks to be able to enforce specific jobs so that we have testing jobs that are done as part of our regularly scheduled pipeline. We have compliance jobs, SOX 2, SOX. We have PCI or whatnot. And then taking a look at those results, having those results in the merge request helps the developer to understand what kind of vulnerabilities are being built into that feature branch before they're being merged within the default branch. And you also recall that we talked about merge request approvals as a way to be able to control what kind of vulnerabilities are being included within your default branch. We can also do that for licenses. Uh, also taking a look at the SBOM, the software bill of materials, and understanding what open source components we're currently using and the vulnerabilities and risks that are associated with them. Taking a look at license compliance and how those licenses adhere within our corporate policies. If we don't want to include specific licenses because they have specific obligation, we could set up a policy to be able to flag for those licenses and require a merge request approval for them. And then on-demand scans. We set up a couple on-demand scans for our DAS testing to be able to run a dynamic scan on our application to look for what kind of vulnerabilities we have there. And then we took a look at our SAS. We also looked at audit events, right? What has happened with our project? What kind of an audit trail do we have as to what's been modified, what's been changed? And finally, we just transferred the project to our own namespace so we have the ability to work on it later on. So that's our conclusion of the lab. And I thank you so much for your attendance and also your participation. And it, we're still here. If you have any questions, we have a little bit of time to be able to answer them. We're happy to do so. Yeah. Very good question. They are similar to the CI. In fact, let me go ahead and I can see if I can, since we have a little extra time, I can see if I can pull up the project. Right, right. So to illustrate James's point, here is a project that I was working on last night that doesn't have a GitLab CI.yaml file. And the reason why is because I have enabled Auto DevOps for this. So if I go into my CI CD within the settings, you'll see that I've got an Auto DevOps section that's there. And so now I'm defaulting to Auto DevOps. So what the Auto DevOps does is it takes a look at your code base itself to be able to understand what type of language it's built in to understand what types of tests you should associate with it, to understand how it needs to be built, how it needs to be deployed. <laughs> In fact, it does a lot for you without even having to worry about the YAML file. So this would be a way that you could avoid doing those. And sure enough, I was able to create a pipeline based on auto DevOps. And now, right now, it's saying blocked, but that's a good thing. Because what I've done is I've set up this project to do a Canary uh, deployment. So I can take a look at my application even before it goes into production. So here, 
I'm actually deploying this within a GCP cluster that has a URL there. This is my application, and it's a very simple project. But it's showing the, uh, the application itself being deployed into a Canary environment, so I can take a look at it even before it goes into production. What I also probably passed over there, too, is I also have a review stage. So because this was run on the default branch or the main branch, is why I get that production environment to be able to deploy within. Had I been doing this within a feature branch, it would stop at the review process. But this review process still gives you the ability to be able to see what the application looks like from, well, not in this case, because I already cleaned up the environment, unfortunately. But I can look at it. I can show you it again. But anyway, what the review stage allows you to do is take a look at the feature branch and any changes you've done in the feature branch and see how those changes have been incorporated as a deployment, but it's really just a review deployment. It's not stage, it's not a canary, it has nothing to do with production, but it gives you the ability to be able to take a look at the application before going further with it. Okay, one last You can, you can. In fact, we have different environments that we can identify and be able to define within our deployment model to be able to say, okay, first I wanted to deploy here and then I wanted to deploy there. So you have the ability to be able to do that as well. Thank you. Yeah, of course, of course. Any other questions or anything so far? Yes, please. Yeah, or the compliance frameworks can also be assigned to groups as well. So you have the ability to be able, yeah. Because from a GitLab user, so this is also a concept within GitLab, which is the ability to be able to organize your projects by groups. And the information from those groups feed up into the higher level group. So for instance, on security, if you have security vulnerabilities that exist within a project, those security vulnerabilities will be shown in the group level too. So I don't know if I kind of explained that. I didn't so much. But here I've got a group called GCP Cluster. These are all the different applications that I'm deploying out to Kubernetes Cluster out on GCP. It seems like it's, yeah. But if I take a look at the vulnerabilities that are here, and I take a look at the vulnerability report, I get a readout of the group that's associated with the GCP Cluster. So these are all the different severities there. You'll see the numbers get very high. But it even gets higher if I go into my namespace and then take a look at my vulnerability report there that's going to incorporate everything that I've got in my namespace. So now you've got a roll up that's happening from a group level, from a project level, to the namespace level or the organization level, they call it now. We also have the ability to be able to look at a security dashboard that tells you of all the projects I have, how well are they doing from a security perspective? Right now I've got 14 projects that are getting an F grade. I've got five projects that are getting an A grade. But of course these are demo projects, so I'm having them be vulnerable by definition so I can show the capabilities and so forth anyway. So you've got that, and so you've got the vulnerability report I showed you already. But yes, thank you for the question. You have the ability to be able to assign these by groups as well as by project. So you have the ability to enforce them across many projects at the same time versus just an individual project. Any other questions? So far, so good? All right, thank you once again for your attendance and participation. I really appreciate it. Any questions or anything? Ask James, because I'm done. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>